everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk today. So uh, just to level set, how many of you know what I mean when I say cat net rule? OK, pretty knowledgeable crowd. And ARP spoofing? Yep, pretty good. OK. Right, so what I am going to show you uh, this morning is a, an exploit that uh, a chap called Daniel Siggy, who was working in my team over the summer, uh, he discovered this, and we were sufficiently sort of surprised that this was possible, that we reported it to the Kubernetes security team. And they said, yeah, it's kind of working as designed, but if you wanted to raise the profile of like mitigating against this, that might be a very good idea. So what I'm going to show you is on a just regular, ordinary Kubernetes cluster with default settings, a layer two networking plugin, and the one thing I have changed, and this is only to make it um, more reliable as a demo, is that out of the box you would get two instances of core DNS, and I've deleted it so there's only one. Now, before I actually show you the exploit, I want to just talk through what's going to happen. So, I have a victim pod, and the victim pod wants to make some kind of network request to, well, in my case, to the outside world. And when it does, let's say, a curl request to example.com, it needs to do a DNS lookup. And under normal circumstances, that DNS lookup is going to go to core DNS, and core DNS is going to return the IP address associated with example.com and the victim is going to be able to make its request. That's all well and good. And then, when we have the exploit, um, the same thing is going to happen. The victim is going to be trying to make a network request to example.com. It's going to do the DNS lookup. But this time, my hacker pod, I'm going to have a hacker pod that is spoofing DNS queries. It's going to receive the DNS lookup request and it's going to redirect that request to another pod that I'm going to set up that's called fake. All right, let's see this happening. Hopefully this is going to be big enough to, oh, I need to change my, if at any point I forget to change my screen, just shout at me, okay? Um, I'm just going to run a little utility that's going to trace out um, requests for capable flags. I'll come back and talk about that a little bit later. So, right, I'm going to start my uh, three pods, which are in this directory. So there's my fake pod, my hacker pod, and my victim pod created. And uh, first of all, let's exec into the victim pod. I'll just run a shell in that. Uh, I'm going to run a shell into my fake pod. Oh, I need to type the word exec. That will help. Fake. Also run a shell in there. And we're going to run a shell in my hacker pod. Okay. So inside my victim, I can curl to example.com, I hope. And we get back some HTML. It's worked. It's done a normal network request. OK. So I'm going to find out what the IP address is of my fake destination. OK. And I'm also going to set this up so that it can start responding with like, some arbitrary content. Why don't I say, hello, KubeCon. And it's going to basically listen on port 80 and respond to network. I don't like the look of that. I think something's gone wrong with my typing. I don't think the... Uh, I'm going to just remove that exclamation mark. That's probably a bad idea. OK. All right. So my fake pod is ready to accept web requests, and it's going to respond with hello, KubeCon. Right. In my hacker pod, I have a hosts file. And I'm just going to change kind of like a DNS 
lookup file. And I'm going to say that example. Oops. Do that again. My typing is not good today, is it? Let's, let's do that one more time. Right. So I'm saying that example.com is at the IP address that's actually the IP address of my fake pod. Right, and now I'm going to run a little exploit script. All of this is on GitHub, and I'll give you the uh, URL for that later. And after we've seen it, I will explain what's going on. It's now ready to take over DNS requests. And if I go back into my victim pod and I curl example.com, it's a little bit slower than the request to the normal network, but we start seeing the uh, spoof DNS response, and then we see we've been able to supply fake traffic. The victim was perfectly under the impression that it was communicating with example.com, but our fake response has arrived instead. Which is pretty scary, right? That's like kind of DNS takeover without changing any defaults at all. Okay, so let's have a talk about what's actually happening here. And uh, first of all, we'll talk a little bit about address resolution protocol. And in order to talk about that, let's just briefly remind ourselves about the seven layers of networking. We don't really care about all seven layers for this talk. We really only care about three layers. The uh, application layer, where we're going to make that HTTP request, the network layer that deals in IP traffic, and the data link layer, which is dealing with Ethernet packets. So when our victim pod makes that request to an, a URL, DNS is what translates the human readable name into an IP address, and then address resolution protocol is what takes that IP address and maps it to a MAC address. So there's a ARP table that gets built up that has these mappings between IP addresses and MAC addresses that are known to the local, well, to the node. So I could uh, take a look at that if I, um, you know what, I'll do it on a different screen. This is the same node, um, but I can look at the ARP table screen. Right. Why haven't I got mirror displays going on anymore? Yes, good, okay. So um, if we look at the IP addresses as well, um, get odds with wide output from all the namespaces. So uh, it's a little bit, because it's wrapped, it's a little bit confusing to see, but pods we're interested in, there's our core DNS pod, and that's at 1032.0.2, which is, well, it's the second, line, second highlighted line there, and it's got the, been able to fake in the ARP table, it's got the same MAC address as 10.32.0.3, which uh, is here. No, no, it's not. That's an old one. There it is. There we go. So that's the hacker pod. That's kind of what we saw. That aligns with the, the exploit we saw, right? So just to understand what's happening here and how kind of how big the risk is here. Let's just revise a little bit about pod networking. We start with a network namespace on the host, the root network namespace, and it's got some Ethernet connection to the outside world, and it's also got a bridge, and the bridge is what holds that ARP table. Now we create a pod, and 
The pod also gets a network namespace. It has a Ethernet connection. It's a virtual connection. It's fake. But it looks like we've plugged an Ethernet cable in from our pod into that bridge. From a networking perspective, it's exactly as if there was an Ethernet cable between the two. And on the bridge side, there's this virtual Ethernet connection that has a kind of a MAC address associated with it. We create another pod. We're going to get a similar situation. We've got uh, another virtual Ethernet link between the bridge and that pod. So if pod A wants to send traffic to um, pod B, it's got an IP address for pod B. Well, first of all, the packet has nowhere else to go other than out of F0 and uh, through that virtual Ethernet uh, tunnel to the bridge. And the bridge does the ARP lookup. Do I have an entry in the ARP table for the IP address of B? And if it does, it maps it to that uh, MAC address. In this case, it's the virtual Ethernet pair for this pod B, and the packet gets routed through that connection and into the pod. If pod A wants to send a packet to some other destination that isn't on this node, then the packet gets routed out of the pod in exactly the same way. But when it arrives at the bridge, there is no ARP table entries. Because the ARP table only has entries for uh, connections on that bridge. And that's only in this node. So we can only have ARP table lookups for pods that are running on this node. If X isn't on this node, by kind of definition, it can't have an entry in that bridge, and the packet's going to just get rooted out. It becomes a layer three problem, and I'm not going to dive into that now. So if we want to do ARP spoofing, basically all we need to do is pretend that an IP address is at the MAC address that we're actually living on. So uh, if I was pod B, I could pretend that uh, the MAC address of the VF1 is an IP address, but it isn't really, but I'm going to pretend it is. And that's what ARP spoofing is. And then because we've told the bridge, yeah, I own that IP address, it's over here on my MAC address, the bridge will quite happily send IP packets to that MAC address. So if you're able to send ARP packets, you can take over any IP address that's on the same node. Quite scary. So having achieved the ability to do ARP spoofing, if you're co-located with the DNS service, you can fake the, you can ARP spoof the address of that DNS service, then you're going to receive those DNS requests and you can tell the requester that the, uh, the domain name exists at some different IP address from what it actually exists at. So if we're making a DNS request on the victim pod, just like before, it gets routed through to the bridge, uh, or sent through to the bridge, really. I should, probably shouldn't say routed. The bridge says, do I have an entry in my ARP table for Core DNS's IP address? And the hacker pod has been saying, yeah, I'm over here with Core DNS's IP address. Send it to me. Bridge believes it, sends the DNS request to the hacker pod, and the hacker pod can respond with any kind of result it wants to. So DNS requests are looking up uh, the IP address that corresponds for, to a domain name. You send that DNS request to the IP address of a DNS service. If you are co-located on the same node as the DNS service, you can take over DNS. The best way of preventing this from happening is to stop the hacker pod from being able to uh, populate information into that ARP table. And the way you can stop that is by preventing it from being able to uh, open raw network sockets. Essentially, that catnet raw capability. So most of you put your hands up when, we talk, when I mentioned um, 
catnet rule. But just in case there were a few people who didn't have their hands up, catnet rule is one of a set of Linux capabilities. Dozens of these capabilities, actually I haven't counted, I'm going to guess dozens, um, and they give quite fine-grained privileges inside the Linux kernel. To send normal IP traffic, you don't need any special capabilities. But if you want to open what's called a raw socket, and if you want to send packets directly at that Ethernet level, you need the CatNet raw privilege. So one way we can prevent this from happening is to drop that capability. By default in Kubernetes, you get all the capabilities have to explicitly drop them. And we could do that with a, um, uh, a security context in the pod definition. So if I can figure out how to change the screen again, um, this is where, this is why I was running this uh, tracer application up in this top window. Uh, this is a new eBPF based open source project that we've just uh, released a couple of weeks ago. It's still very experimental. It's called Tracy, and it lets us trace out kernel events and, um, well, system calls and some kernel events, one of which is cap capable, which is the event that happens when you're checking whether you've got a certain set of capabilities. So we can see uh, a ton of these checks to see whether or not the process has CapNet raw, and that's basically happening every time it wants to send one of these ARP packets. I'm going to just stop this for, from now, and I'm going to run a, um, let's just check where it is. Uh, yeah, I've got a pod definition just like the one I showed you on the screen, which is dropping that net raw capability. So if I run that one. And in all other respects, it's exactly the same as the hacker pod I showed you. Uh, I need to exec into that. Um, so this one is going to be called hacker drop cap. Okay, and if I run the exploit this time, what we're going to see is it will fail because it's going to make that first CatNet raw request and that's going to be failed and basically the exploit code doesn't know how to deal with that. So there we go. There is the CatNet raw check that failed. So you might be thinking, but I'm not going to run this crazy, like, why would I run this crazy hacker pod on my cluster? That would be madness. Of course it would be madness. I'm not suggesting you're going to run the hacker pod. I'm suggesting that somebody might compromise a pod in your cluster and run something like this without you intending them to. So suppose you have a pod that has some kind of uh, vulnerability and an attacker is able to get into that pod through that vulnerability, maybe they're going to start running code like this hacker pod. But if you have removed the CapNet raw capability, they won't be able to do this particular exploit. So that would be good. Security contexts are a, a, you know, a bit of a pain to manage. Uh, you could have a pod security policy that requires making sure that you have dropped the uh, net raw on all your pods, or at least on all the pods that you don't explicitly need to be opening raw <coughs> sockets. I also looked at the Gatekeeper admission controller. So is anybody here using Gatekeeper? OK, very small number of hands. So um, Gatekeeper is using Open Policy Agent, which we heard about in the keynotes this morning. And it has a variety of these different rego kind of templates, um, making it easy to use Open Policy Agent, basically. And they have this uh, Git, well, this 
repo um, called pod security policies. It sounds really encouraging. It says it contains the common policies needed in pod security policy, but implemented as constraints and constraint templates with Gatekeeper. So I thought, yeah, this would be really cool. We could use Gatekeeper to make sure pods don't have that CapNet raw capability, except it does all the things in pod security policy except Linux capabilities, which I was a bit disappointed about. So maybe at some point that will be added to Gatekeeper, but right now that is not a solution that will fix this particular problem for us. So you've got this security context option. There are also a couple of things you can do at the network layer to prevent this exploit from being possible. One is that you can use a layer three networking plugin. And uh, if, again, I can figure out how to switch screens, uh, I have another single node cluster running. This one, I believe, has a Calico running. Uh, so let's just look at the cube system namespace. Yes, yeah, so this is using Calico, which is a layer three networking plugin. And if I try to, I'm running the exact same hacker pod here. Um, and if I go into that one and I try running the exploits, it's going to tell us something that isn't exactly true. It thinks that it's running on a different node from cube DNS. That's not true. It says cube DNS, it means the DNS service for cube. It's actually core DNS. Um, there's a single node cluster. So I know for sure they are running on the same node. But what it means is from the, what its expectations are, it's not on the same, it's not on the same bridge. So, and you can see here there's some, you know, this is not a MAC address that you could send packets to. So, if you're using a layer three network plugin, you are safe from this exploit. How many of you are using layer two? How many of you don't know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. There is another thing that you can do to uh, make this exploit go away, which is you can configure core DNS to use TLS. That's actually a pretty simple configuration change. Uh, and that uh, at least when I tried it, it prevented the exploits. I don't know if it's possible for the exploits to somehow get hold of the certificates. But that certainly seemed to prevent, uh, prevent the exploit out of the box. So, in summary, if you're using a layer two network plugin and you have a pod that gets compromised and it happens to be running on the same node as your DNS service. If that compromised pod has CapNet raw, that compromised pod could take over your DNS service and could ruin internet traffic from other pods on that node. And that would be a bad day at the office. All right, so you might be wondering, how can I tell whether my cluster is affected, apart from whether or not it's, you know, you might know whether you're running layer two or layer three plugin. Uh, you could try the exploit for yourself, because I'm going to give you the URL so you can try running it yourself. Uh, we've also built a test for this into Cube Hunter. Uh, can I get a hands up if you've heard of Cube Hunter? Okay, maybe about half of you. So Cube Hunter is a project that we built that does kind of penetration testing for Kubernetes clusters. And it has a whole series of things that it will attempt to do and report back whether it found anything that's maybe misconfigured or that kind of leaks information or is an outright vulnerability. And uh, we added a test for this, ARP, well, two tests, one for the ARP spoofing and one for the DNS spoofing. And I hope if I find the right screen, uh, I've got some 
logs, I hope. Uh, in yeah, so this was a result of me running the cube hunter on that first node with the layer two plugin. So let's just get the logs from that. Oops. And that looks a bit big. Let's try and make it smaller. So uh, you can see that it was able to, it tested to find out that it could use CapNet Raw um, and that there's a possibility of ARP spoofing and a possibility of DNS spoofing. So to run Cube Hunter to check this effectively, you actually run Cube Hunter as a job inside the cluster. You can also run Cube Hunter external to the cluster and it will do various tests, but this is not one of the tests that it can effectively test. It has to be inside the cluster. But hopefully you will find that useful to establish whether or not, for example, your default service accounts or the service accounts that you use allow CapNet, CapNet Raw. So I've shown you a whole load of things there, um, which I kind of hope at least some of you will go away and, um, and try out for yourselves. So the three links there. The first one is the exploit itself. So that's under Daniel Sagi's repo. Uh, and it's a, well, you saw it, it's a Python exploit. And it has all the configuration for the um, hacker pod and the um, victim pod. There's Cube Hunter penetration testing, and Tracy, which is this new tool for tracing out events using eBPF. We would love feedback, in particular on Tracy, because we've only released that a couple of weeks ago. Um, just yesterday, I had conversations with three different people who had three really interesting ideas about things we could do with Tracy. So I'm really, really interested to hear what your ideas are around that as well. And I've also mentioned that tomorrow morning, uh, Myself and Michael Hausenblass are going to be signing books, the book that we wrote about Kubernetes security. So come and pick up a copy of that tomorrow. With that, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Don't make them too hard. <laughs> uh, thanks, Liz. Um, on the Schedule app, you can rate this talk. So if you enjoyed this talk, give it a happy face and provide feedback, and that helps. Uh, that helps speakers with their future events. All right, uh, first hand that I saw is over here. And thank you for coming, everyone. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Any legitimate use of Capro that we might want? Um. It's hard to think of why you would want to do low-level networking as an application. I, I could believe there would be things in you know, the sort of system infrastructure. I don't immediately have an example. At the application layer, I really don't think so. Diagnostics. Diagnostics, there's a great example. Uh, hi. Uh, I was... Uh, wondering, th th is there any configurations uh, that you had to do with Calico in order to mitigate the... the no, just no. by installing it? No. So I, and I'm the free of the bug. Yeah, the reason why that works is because um, the, the MAC addresses are not... Uh, it's There's not like a single look up from, a, from the root bridge to... It, from... It looks from the perspective of this exploit as if your pods are actually on different nodes. They're not, but the way it goes up to layer three and back again in Calico. I see. I'm, I'm happy now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, rate with those happy faces. And if, if you're unhappy, come and speak to me. <laughs> uh, so very much a cube noob here, uh, am I? And uh, uh, I'm just wondering like, if you know or if anybody knows of why you wouldn't just use layer three networking all the time. It seems kind of foolish to even have a broadcast domain inside your cluster. Um, is there performance reasons to prefer having layer two networking over layer three 
uh, for some workloads? I'm sure there are networking experts who can answer that question better than I can. I think there are concerns about whether it's performant or not, and I'm sure there are layer three people who will tell you it, that's not a concern. So find a networking person. Go to the CNI meetup. Uh, great talk, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could take the same sort of exploit and use it in layer three by trying to uh, in publish a BGP route to the DNS pod. I, I don't know if, yeah. do you know if that could be done? We haven't tried it. I've kind of wondered the same question. We haven't actually explored it yet, but um, awesome. Thanks. let's hope not. <laughs> Because that's how security works, right? We just cross our fingers and hope. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any more? Anyone else? Yeah, I see one right here. my left. Uh, uh, is there any uh, drawback of uh, dropping a uh, cap uh, network capability uh, other than ICMP stuff uh, doesn't work uh, without uh, tweaking uh, security barriers? Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, is there any uh, disadvantage of uh, dropping a uh, cap natural capability? Right, um, so the only thing that you can't do if you drop that privilege is open raw sockets. So unless you have a reason to, to do that, there is no disadvantage. Um, some of the capabilities are a bit like kind of tied up into more than one thing, but this particular one is very straightforward. So unless you have a reason to write Ethernet packets, it's completely fine. I, I actually believe that uh, the CNIs actually need that kind of capabilities. Uh, I'm pretty sure they do. So That's if true. you I, cannot remove completely out of your ecosystem, true. otherwise the CNI won't work. That is a very good point, that application pods have no reason to do that. The system pods, yes. All right. I'm also really new to Kubernetes, so I don't know the networking details. And clearly, the problem is a shared ARP table. That's the exploit. Uh, but is the ARP table actually in the bridge, or is it somewhere else? Because normally, in most network, I don't see the ARP tables in the bridge. They're actually associated with the interfaces each. In a virtual machine model, there are those places. Um, is the bridge really where that ARP table is in the stack? My understanding is that it is. Okay. I would stand to be corrected if yeah, I didn't know I'm, better. I'm new to this, so I don't know either. Yeah. I just looks uh, it, it stands out. Okay. All right. Happy faces, everyone, right? <laughs> Thank you very much.